Well, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, I, I always know when I come to Mims Baptist Church in Conroe, Texas, that uh, several things I'm going to experience. One, I'm going to hear some glorious, glorious music. You know, nobody likes that kind of music anymore uh, except Jesus and the people. Uh, thank you very much, Karen Peck and New River. Uh, you know, I would really like to be here tonight to hear the concert, but the pastor didn't invite me to stay. He said, we, we're going to get you on a plane and send you off this afternoon. So, you know, I don't know, Pastor, uh, you know, but, but I will say this. This is my 10th consecutive year uh, to be here at Mims Baptist. I know I'm going to hear great music. And uh, I, I know I'm going to be with sweet, sweet people, and, uh, and I know I'm going to be with a wonderful, wonderful pastor and staff. Uh, you know, he's in the will of God again this year. Uh, you know your pastor is in the will of God if I show up in a year's time. Uh, if a year goes by and I'm not here, he's in a backslidden condition and needs to be prayed for. But, uh, you know, last night uh, we were having a delightful meal together, and I want to be sure I got this right, Pastor, so you correct me if, I, if I'm incorrect on it. But I think what you said was if uh, LSU wins tomorrow night, I'll come four times next year. Is that, I, I thought that's what I heard you said. Uh, you know, I, I think you can be saved and be an LSU fan. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and I even think it's possible for some, not many, but some LSU fans to be spirit-filled. I, I think that's true. But I'm not sure. You may can be saved, but I'm not sure you can be spirit-filled if you're a Clemson fan. So, I mean, you know, uh, the be, the, that's the best we can do. But uh, uh, we're going to have a big time tomorrow night. But, uh, and you know, of course, it's always a joy to be with uh, Brother Fred Gilbert. Uh, you know... I, I want to tell you, I, I, uh, I, you know, Brother Fred Gilbert, I've known him for a long, long time. In fact, the fact of the matter is, he was my boyhood hero. Uh, when, when I was just a little boy, my mama used to play his music to put me to sleep at night. And uh, I, I remember when I was in kindergarten one time, Brother Fred was singing uh, in a church in our area. And uh, Mama took me out of kindergarten one uh, morning, and we drove all afternoon uh, to get to where Brother Fred was singing. And uh, that uh, after the concert was over that night, I, I was so excited, you know, and I had my little Bible uh, in my hand, and I went up to Brother Fred, and, and, and I said, Brother Gilbert, would you sign my Bible for me? And he was just so gracious, you know, and he signed his Bible, and then he looked at me, and he said, I believe uh, that you'll grow up to be a preacher, son. And uh, then he uh, reached out his hand and, and put his hand on my head. There was so much power in that man's hand that my hair started falling out from that day <laughs> to this. <laughs> no, I've known Brother Fred for a long time. Love your pastor. Love all of you. I've been watching some of uh, the Bible conference online. You know, that's an amazing thing. I didn't get to listen to every message, but I, I, I listened to several of them, and several of them messed up pretty good, so I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll try to straighten them out. But uh, I know you have been blessed. I know it's been a wonderful week of Bible conference, and, and to let me come and, and preach today. Uh, is a real blessing, and I thank you and, uh, for it and, Pastor, for letting me come. I want you to turn in your Bible this morning to the book of Genesis, uh, the 37th chapter. And I'm going to read a few verses here, but then I want you to keep your Bible open to Genesis because we will be looking at several other chapters uh, around the particular verses I'm going to read this morning. Uh, Genesis chapter 37 and uh, I'm going to begin reading with verse 15 and read down through verse 19. Uh, in Genesis 37, 15, it says, And a certain man found him, that is, Joseph. A certain man found Joseph. And behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence 
For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. Now, now that's not Dothan, Alabama. That's, this is the Holy Land we're talking about here. And, and Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they, that is the brothers, saw him, that is Joseph, afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Uh, in my daily devotions, I started again, as I always do every year, in the book of Genesis, and I read through my Bible uh, in a year's time. And, and it always uh, strikes me, and it struck me again this year, when you read the book of Genesis to discover that one-fourth of the book of Genesis has to do with a single individual, the man Joseph. Now, of course, you know that the Genesis begins with the account of creation. And as you're reading about God's creation in Genesis chapter 1, you come to the 16th verse, and it makes a statement. It says, He made the stars also. Five words about the stars. In uh, the 1920s, uh, astronomers estimated that there were 300 billion stars. In the 1950s, Sir James Jean, the eminent uh, astronomer, said, that there are more stars than all of the grains of sand on all of the seashores uh, in the earth. And so here the scripture says he dismisses all of the billions and billions of stars in five words. He made the stars also, and yet he spends 14 chapters, a fourth of the book of Genesis, on the life of a man named Joseph. Now, why do you think that is the, uh, the way God does it? Well, the reason God does it this way, ladies and gentlemen, is because God is more interested uh, in uh, saving sinners than he is in shaping stars. Uh, God is more interested in regeneration than he is in creation. God is more interested in you and in your life and how you live it and what you become than he is in all of the billions and the billions of stars that he created. It's always been rather interesting to me the statement that is made by the brothers of Joseph right in the midst of the account of this man named Joseph. The Bible says that they called him this dreamer. And as we'll see in just a little while, they did that for a particular reason. Uh, the English translation really uh, cannot bring out to you uh, the sarcasm uh, and the bitterness and the venom that is in, contained in these words. They look at Joseph coming, and with hate in their hearts, they said, Behold, this dreamer uh, cometh. But do you know sometimes what is intended to be an accusation becomes an accolade? Uh, sometimes what is intended to be a criticism becomes a compliment. Do you remember when the enemies of Jesus said to him, uh, this about him, this man eateth with, uh, uh, this man receiveth sinners and, and eateth with them. You see, what they intended to be a complaint became a great compliment. Aren't you glad today that Jesus is the friend of sinners? Aren't you glad today that Jesus receiveth sinners and eateth with them? And so the statement here, this dreamer cometh, really becomes kind of a complimentary statement that magnifies the life of this man, Joseph. And so what I want to do for a little while this morning, I want to just uh, take uh, the main themes and the main scenes of the life of Joseph and build those scenes around this dreamer. Uh, for instance, let's begin in Genesis chapter 37 where we are now, and let's label scene number one, special uh, dreams. Here we will notice in this 37th chapter that this man Joseph has some special uh, uh, dreams. Now the chapter opens with some account uh, of the family of uh, uh, Joseph. We're told, for instance, in verse 1 that Jacob is his father. We're told in verse 2 that Joseph was 17 years of age. We're told about his uh, brothers and, and, and all of those things. Uh, you know, one of the mysteries of life to me is why we are born in the particular family in which we are born. Uh, have you ever thought about that? Uh, you and I had nothing, nothing absolutely to say about the family in which we were born. Uh, yet, you see, nobody asked us if we wanted to be born red or yellow, black or white. 
No one asked us if we wanted to be born in a Christian home or in an atheist home. No one asked us if we wanted to be born in the mansion of a wealthy man or in the little apartment of a single mother. Nobody asked us if we wanted to be born gifted are uh, born retarded. Nobody asked us if we wanted to be born in this century or a previous century. No one asked us if we wanted to be born into a rich family or a poor family. None of us had any choice about the family in which we were born. And sometimes that can be a difficulty. But ladies and gentlemen, just let me remind you that God is too wise to make a mistake and God is too loving to be unkind. God has a reason for the particular family in which you were born. Now, the family of Joseph uh, probably is kind of like most of your families and and, and all of our families. Uh, It had its good points. Uh, You see, he was born into the family of a man named uh, Jacob, one of the great heroes, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, there are many of you this morning, and you were born into a family of faith. You were born into a Christian home. You have a Christian mom and a Christian dad. What a blessing that is. I I hope you're thankful this morning if you had the privilege of being born in a Christian family. But then there are others of you, and you were not born in a Christian family. And you were born in a family that had a multitude and still has a a multitude of, of problems today. Well, you see, ladies and gentlemen, it is not so important uh, where you were born, but it is important about uh, how you respond to where you were born. Uh, Joseph family was a family of faith, but it also had its problems uh, as well. Uh, you know, he, his mother, Rachel, died when he was very, very young. Think of that, a young boy coming up without a mother. And, and then he had an indulgent uh, uh, father, uh, Jacob. And you know, uh, Jacob uh, showed favoritism to him and, and gave him a coat of many colors, uh, as the account tells here. And, and that incurred the, the uh, jealousy and, and the hate, uh, hatred of his uh, brothers. And we're told in in verse 4 that his brothers uh, saw uh, that the father loved Joseph more than them, and they hated him, and they could not speak uh, uh, peaceably to him. Uh, Can you imagine uh, the pressure that that Joseph experienced from his brothers? Uh, Can you hear him now? Come on, Joe. Don't be such a sissy. Hey, Joe, want a puff of this? Uh, Hey, Joe, would you like a shot of this? Joe, you want us to get your date with sexy Sally? Can you imagine how they put the pressure on this man, Joseph? And yet, in spite of the family in which he was born, this man, Joseph, is going to have some special, special dreams. Uh, You see, ladies and gentlemen, God has a plan for your life. And God had a plan for Joseph's life. And uh, you will notice in verse 5, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream. And as the account goes on, he actually dreams two dreams. He dreams the story, the dream of the the sheaves. You remember that? And and all of the others' sheaves bowed down before his. That really made him popular with his brothers. Uh, And then he had a dream about the stars, the sun and the moon and the stars. And they all bowed down and did obeisance to him. That made them really like him, didn't they, as well? Now, now you see what's going on in Joseph's life uh, is probably what's going on in your life as well. You see, at a very early age, he was dreaming dreams. He was thinking about his uh, future. Uh, You know, dreaming is a part of growing up. Uh, Dreaming is a part of being a little boy and a little girl. Uh, Our imaginations can cause us to to dream some things. I heard about a little boy one day came running in to his mom and said, Mom, Mom, uh, there's a a bear out in the yard. And scared Mama, and she ran and looked at the window. And out there in the yard was a scrawny little dog. And, And she said, Son, You go upstairs and you tell God the lie that you told and don't you come down until God forgives you. Well, the little old boy went up there and just in a little bit, the little boy came right back down and she said, "Uh, son, did you tell God uh, what you had uh, said? He said, yes, mama, I did. She said, well, what did God tell you? And uh, the little boy said, well, 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 mama, God said, uh, uh, don't feel bad about it. He thought it was a bear first time he saw it too. And, And so, you know, we dream dreams, don't we? 
Uh, I heard about a boy who had been dating his girl forever, and uh, and she was waiting for a proposal, you know. And and one night, they they on a date here at night. He said to her, he said, you know, he said last night I, I dreamed I proposed to you. Uh, what in the world do you think that means? She said, I think it means you got more sense of sleep than when you're awake. We we dream dreams. And I look back on my life, and I remember some dreams I had when I was a little boy. Uh, I remember I had a pet chicken one time. And, oh, I love that little old pet chicken, but the pet chicken died. And, and so I took the, the little dead chicken, and I put it in a cigar box. And I got my little friends in the neighborhood, and we went up to the church nearby. nearby and, and we walked in, and I put the chicken down there on the communion table. And I got in f behind that pulpit, and I preached a chicken funeral. And I preached that chicken right into heaven, never dreaming that I was having dreams that God was preparing me for what he wanted to me to do in my life. Oh, if you're dreaming some big dreams today, make them special dreams. You see, the Bible says God has a will. God has a plan for your life. And uh, Romans 12, 2 says it is God's acceptable and perfect uh, uh, will uh, of God for you. Uh, make up your mind this morning that you want to do the will of God. Make up your mind that for your life it's the will of God, nothing less, nothing more, nothing else. Dream big dreams. Who knows what God may do for your life if you'll dream some big dreams for God. Now, you know, when you dream big dreams and make up your mind you want to do the will of God and, and nothing else but the will of God, uh, when, you, when you do that, uh, everything, uh, then when you say yes to God, then everything's fine, isn't it? Well, not necessarily. Uh, because we move to the next scene here, and we have the account uh, of the brothers of Joseph. And uh, Joseph's father sent him out to find those brothers, and he finds them, and they see him coming, and they, uh, they say with all the sarcasm and hatred they can, Behold, this dreamer cometh. And when he gets to them uh, with a howl of rage, they leap upon him like a pack of wild dogs. And they tear off that despised coat and they wrestle him to the ground and then they roll him into the pit. And they said, we'll just leave him there and we'll kill him uh, soon later on. And then you know the account. The Bible tells us that a, a, a group of uh, merchants come along, some Midianites, and they're on their way down into Egypt. You know the story. I, I, I won't go into all of the details of it. But uh, when the merchants came along, uh, the brothers of Joseph said, hey, we got a strong boy down in that pit, make a good slave down in Egypt. How would you like to have it? He said, well, pull him up. Let's take a look at him. And they get old Joseph up, and I can see him now. Can't you? They're checking his teeth out, see if he's got good teeth. And, and they're checking his feet out, you know, is he going to be able to work? And, and they said, what do you want for this boy? And they said, well, we want 50 pieces of silver. 50 pieces of silver. That's an outrage. I'll not give you a dime more than 10 pieces of silver. And they haggled a little while. And then the next thing you know, they have sold Joseph, uh, as the Scripture tells us in verse 28, for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Can you see it now as the slave traders are hauling Joseph away? Uh, can you see? Can you see those brothers? And they say, bye-bye, Joey boy, sweet dreams, special dreams. But now let's move to scene number two. Uh, turn in your Bible over to Genesis chapter 38, uh, 39. Look at Genesis chapter 39, and, and I want to call this scene uh, Shattered Dreams. Oh, what a journey it must have been. Young Joseph is strapped to the side of uh, a covered wagon of the slave traders. And he can hear the, the crack of the whip over his head as the slave masters make their way down into Egypt. And, and scattered along behind the wagon are the pieces of the shattered dreams of a young boy named Joseph. Do I speak to someone in this room this morning and you hold in your hands today some shattered dreams? 
Do I speak to someone in midlife today and when you were a young person at a camp somewhere or in a service somewhere, you committed your life to the Lord and you had special dreams, but things haven't turned out the way you intended them to be and you are holding in your hands in this service this morning the shattered dreams of what might have been. I want you to follow these shattered dreams If you read Genesis chapter 39 carefully, you just can't miss the fact that there is a phrase that is repeated four times in this chapter. Notice in your Bible in Genesis 39. Look at what it says in verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Look at what it says in verse 3, and the master saw that the Lord was with him. Now, drop down toward the end of the chapter and look, if you will, at at verse 21. And notice what it says in verse 21. And the Lord was with Joseph. Look at verse 23. Because the Lord was with him. Uh, In in Hebrew narrative, there is a rhetorical device known as inclusio, uh, which means that uh, sometimes when the Holy Spirit wants to underscore or underline uh, something and make it prominent, what the Holy Spirit does is put it in the beginning of the passage and put it at the end of the passage, inclusio. And it calls attention to what uh, rhetoricians call the meta-narrative. That is the overriding story in what is getting ready to be told. In fact, in Acts chapter 7, verse 9, when uh, uh, the Bible in the New Testament is going to tell the story of Joseph, it says, God was with him. Did you know somewhere in the Bible there's a verse that wraps up your life? What would that verse be if there was a verse somewhere in the Bible that would tell the story of your life? But now keep in mind, as we move through the successive stages of this scene, keep in mind that in all of them, the Lord is with Joseph. Uh, The chapter begins with complication. Uh, Look at uh, verse 1 in 39. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, uh, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down hither. And the Lord was with Joseph. He was prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. He comes down to Egypt. They put him up on the slave block. Uh, Joseph probably was imagining who is going to get me. And the bids begin to come in on who will buy him as a slave. And the highest bidder is a man named Potiphar who is head of the Pharaoh's uh, secret service, the Pharaoh's Gestapo, the Pharaoh's uh, executioners. Did you know that is exactly, I, I, look, young people, I, I heard one of the, Steve Gaines making reference to your young people who were sitting over here in the conference. I don't know where the young people are right now, but young people, that is exactly what the devil wants to do to you. The devil wants to put you on the bargain counter down in the basement of life and label you soiled, cheapened, and sold to the lowest bidder. Young ladies, The devil wants to get you to hook up with some old boy somewhere who will wreck and will ruin your life. Be very, very careful of the bargains that the devil offers to you. And so Joseph is sold into Potiphar's house. Now what's what's Joseph going to do? I mean, things aren't looking real good in Joseph's life right now, are they? He has special dreams, and now he's a slave down there in Joseph uh, in, in Egypt, and, and the, the uh, Potiphar has bought him, and, and things don't look too good. You know what Joseph does? Joseph does exactly what we ought to do. He just makes up his mind. He's just going to do the best he can where he is, and that the Lord is with him, and that somehow God's going to work out a plan. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't always control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to what happens to you. Take the circumstances and the complications of your life, and instead of making them a stumbling stone, make them a stepping stone. Let the things that happen to you make you better, bitter, uh, make you better and not make you bitter. He just decides he'll do the best he can. And the next thing you know, he's in charge of the whole house. And old Potiphar goes down to Starbucks for the afternoon coffee with his buddies. 
and he's talking to him. He said, you know, he said, I, I don't understand it. I don't know what it's all about. But things have really prospered since that slave boy, Joseph, has been in charge of my household. Just do the best you can, and, and people will begin to see. Uh, if you're having a tough time at school, just keep living for Jesus. If you're having a tough time on the job, just keep living for Jesus. If things go against you in the home, just keep on living for Jesus. Complication, uh, God was with him. But then notice what it says at the end of verse 6. Joseph was a goodly person and a well-favored Verse 7, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Now, you see, the devil's not going to let a good man, like young man like Joseph alone. You can just count on that. And uh, there is evidence in the Scripture here that, that Joseph was a very, very handsome young man. In fact, the words that are used in, in verse 6, at the end of verse 6, a goodly person and a well-favored, they're the same words that are used about his mama, Rachel. He inherited his mama's good looks. He was good-looking. Uh, I, I don't know what the girls call him now, but... but you know, back, you know, I can't keep up with what you young people call stuff. I mean, about one time I learned one set of words, then you change the words on me. You know, I, I can't, can't keep up with you. But what, when I was coming along, if there was a really good looking boy and the girls all had their eyes on him, they called him a hunk. Now, I don't know what you call him now, but he was a hunk. I, I mean, he was one of those guys that when he came walking down through the hall of the high school, the girl's eyes were like light bulbs loose in the socket, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, you know, good looks can be a handicap. You know, they, they, say, they say that one out of every three people are either beautiful or brilliant. Now, I want you to look at the people on each side of you. <laughs> and if it's not them, it's you. <laughs> Boy, you can see it coming, can't you? Everywhere Joseph is in the house, she just kind of arranges to be there. She makes that little silly, nonsensical conversation. She blinks those little flash, those little false eyelashes at when she's at him. She comes clicking in on them high heel shoes, you know. <laughs> and then finally, she's got passion. She's, in pa she's like a, an, an animal in heat. And she comes to Joseph and she says to Joseph, the King James puts it this way, lie with me. In the Hebrew, it's just two words, bed me. You know, there's a verse over there in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 where it talks about that we will be able to withstand in the evil day. There may come that special day of temptation. That's why it's important to stay in the Word of God and stay in prayer and close to the Lord Jesus Christ because, Christ, because one of these days, the evil day, bid me. And I can almost imagine the devil saying to Joseph, Joseph, take what she offers. Everybody's doing it. Nobody knows you down here. You're a long way from home. It's not all that bad. Just go ahead. Bed me. Two Hebrew words. In the King James Version of the English, he answers her with 60 words. It's 35 words in the Hebrew language. And notice what he says in verse 8. He refused. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, my master doesn't know what it is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has to my hand. There's none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph understood what sin really is all about. Oh, yeah, he, he would have committed sin against her. He would have sinned against Potiphar, his master. He would have sinned uh, against his family. But basically and fundamentally, ladies and gentlemen, when we sin, we sin against a loving, holy God. Our sin is a slap in the face of a holy God. That's exactly what David understood in Psalm 51 when David said, against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil? 
in thy sight. He refused. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Flee also useful lusts. When the temptation comes, run. When the offers are made to you, run. When they offer you the dope, run. When they try to get you in a crooked business deal, run. It's better, it's better to lose your coat than it is to lose your character. But the day comes and she grabs hold of that coat. And as you read on down through this chapter, you will discover that he ran out of his coat. And, and the moment, the moment he does, this woman, Potiphar, she smears her lipstick, she dishevels her hair, she rips her blouse, and she yells out that she has been raped. And her husband comes home and he hears about it. And he throws this fine young man, Joseph, into prison. If you do what's right, if you resist temptation, if you stay true to Jesus Christ, everything will be all right, all wrong. Somebody said, well, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. That's not necessarily true. Did you know the devil has got crews working overtime, creating false fires on believers who are trying to live for the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 23 about Jesus, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. He committed himself unto him who judges righteously. He's going into prison, lied on. You see, someone said reputation is what people think about you. Character is what God knows about you. Someone said reputation is what they chip on your t tombstone. Character is what the angels say about you before the throne of God. I can almost see it now. He comes into prison. Somebody said, who's that young guy? Oh, that's Joseph. Well, wh what's he down here? Man, had you heard? He hit on Potiphar's wife. Of who? Pot of all people, Potiphar's wife. And they say, come on in, joy boy. Shattered dreams. Now the scene changes, and this scene, we're going to have to kind of put a lot of it together. Because you see, frankly, I preach until I get hungry, <laughs> and then I quit. Are you paying today? I'll get hungry real quick. <laughs> so I'm going to have to put a lot of stuff here together on this third scene about the dream life of, of Joseph. And it begins in, in chapter 14, and it goes to the conclusion. I can't deal with all of it, of course, as you know, in those chapters from 40 to, to 50. But, but I, I want you to just see now what's happening in the life of Joseph. Joseph goes down uh, into the prison, and, and at the end of chapter 39, uh, it says that the, that the keeper uh, of the prison put all the, the prisoners uh, in Joseph. They, they estimate that Joseph probably was in prison, falsely accused for 10 years. And he was so faithful down there that the keeper of the prison just put all the prisoners unto him. And you see in verse 23, because the Lord was with him. Now we move to the third scene in chapter 40. Uh, I said he probably was there about 10 years. And then on a day, uh, the butler and the baker of, of Pharaoh uh, come down, and they're brought down there because of some offenses against uh, uh, Pharaoh. And, and they come down there, and, and they have some dreams. And, and I can see them that, that day. They, they come to Joseph, and they, they say, Joseph, have you ever dreamed? And Joseph said, yeah, I used to dream some dreams. But it's been a long time. My dreams are way back there in the past. And they told him the dreams. You know the dreams. You know the result. Uh, for one of them, the, the butler, it was good news, and he was restored uh, to service in the Pharaoh's house. For the baker, it was bad news, and, and he was hanged thereafter. And as the, the butler uh, makes his way uh, out, Notice what it says in verse 14. Notice what Joseph said. Joseph said, think on me when it shall be well with thee. Show kindness, I pray thee, to me. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh. And I can almost hear the butler as he walks. He says, yeah, you can count on me, Joe. I'll put in a good word for you. 
but he didn't. He totally forgot. Does ingratitude ever bother you? I mean, you do something for somebody and they just don't even bother to thank you. You ever wondered how God must feel? God is so good to us. And, and we're like the, the nine. We're like the nine who didn't, lepers who didn't come back to thank Jesus. Have you thanked Jesus lately for what he's done for you? I heard about a, an old farmer who was at the sale barn there one day, went into the restaurant there to eat. And there were some mean boys sitting in there. And, and the old farmer, as he got ready to eat his meal, he bowed his head and had a prayer. And the boys thought that was so funny. And when he finished his prayer, one of the boys said, Hey, farmer guy, does everybody where you come from bow their head when they eat? And the old farmer never missed a lick. He said, everybody but the hogs. <laughs> Don't be a hog. When's the last time you thank God for saving you? When's the last time you thank God for giving you a faithful mate? When's the last time you thank God for giving you a Christian family? When's the last time you thank God for giving you a wonderful church like you have in this place here? But he forgot him. They say probably... It was two full years. Well, verse 41, uh, in, cha uh, in chapter 41, verse 1, it came to pass at the end of two full years, Pharaoh dreamed a dream. And he brings in, uh, he, he dreams, you know the dreams, it's about the cows and it's the corn and, and all of that, that kind of stuff. And he brings in all of the experts, all of his cabinet. And in verse 8, he said, all the wise men thereof, and, and uh, Pharaoh told him his dream, there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Not a per Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be political here, and I'm not going to be political here, but I, I will just tell you today that the answers to the problem we face in America are not in the White House, they're in the church house. I have a feeling if you took all the politicians in, in Washington and put them end to end, you'd never reach a conclusion. <laughs> I heard about a politician got on a plane, you know, and he said, I, I, think I'll throw, uh, I think I'll throw $10 out the plane and, and make uh, 10 uh, voters happy. Then a little bit later on, he said, I think I'll throw $20 out and make 20 voters happy. One passenger said, why don't you jump out and make all the voters happy? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I believe in the Declaration of Independence. I believe in the Constitution. But the answers to the problems we face in America are found in this book I hold in my hand, the precious word of the living God. We need revival in America, ladies, blessed, bless your heart. But then about that time, the butler said, man, man, I forgot all about him. And notice what he says in verse 9. The chief butler says, I do remember my faults today. Oh, I forgot all about him. There is a young man down there in prison who interpreted my dream, and, and uh, he can interpret dreams. And the Pharaoh said, well, what is his name? He said, uh, let me think. What, what was his name? Oh, oh, yeah, his name was Joseph. Boy, about that time Potiphar's eyes shot up. And a cold chill ran down his back. Now here's Joseph. He's down there in prison. Been there 12 years. Do you think he had any idea when he started work that morning down in the prison that before the day was over, he was going to be the prime minister of all of Egypt? I see him down there. He's just being faithful. That's what you need to do. Just keep on being faithful. Uh, and uh, you, you say, well, preacher, what, what, what are you tagging this third, this third stage? First stage number one is the special dreams. Uh, stage number two are shattered dreams. Oh, 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 I forgot. This stage is sweet dreams. Pharaoh's uh, assistant comes down there to Joseph and said, Joseph, shave, put you on some good clothes. We're going to see Pharaoh. Joseph, go to see who? Pharaoh. Why does he want to see? Man, I don't know why he wants to see you. Get your sensor razor blade out and get a shave and put on the best clothes you got. You want to get me beheaded? 
And the next thing you know, boom, there he stands in front of the mightiest ruler in the world with muscular banded arms, with the double crown upon his head. And there in front of him is a slave boy named Joseph. And the Pharaoh said, hey, they tell me you can interpret dreams. And the devil leans over on the shoulder of Joseph and said, now watch, Joe. And now listen, Joe, don't pull none of this religion stuff on here now. This, this is an important man. Don't you be talking about God now to this man. But did you see what Joseph said? Joseph said in verse 16 of chapter, it's not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever your heart's full of is eventually what you'll talk about. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 46, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings. You'll witness when you're full of Jesus. You'll witness when Christ is number one in your life. And what he says is, it's not me, Pharaoh, it's God. And, and then you know the story. Before the day's over, the Pharaoh has made Joseph number two in the entire land of Egypt. He is the prime minister of the whole deal. Pharaoh goes home. They're sitting at the supper table. He looks over at his wife. He said, do you remember that young slave boy that was in charge of things around the house here? Oh, yeah, I remember him. What of him? Well, I sure, what you, I sure hope what you said is true because of the Pharaoh has made him the prime minister of the land, and I've got to report to his office at 8 o'clock in the morning. Sweet dreams, Joseph. And then you know the story. Uh, God gives him a wife down there in Egypt. And, and also, not only does God give him a, a wife, but he gives him some little boys. Uh, in chapter 41, uh, verse 51, he's got two little boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh means forgetful. Ephraim means fruitful. Little amnesia and little ambrosia. <laughs> Sweet dreams, Joseph. He's got him a family. And he's reconciled to his brothers. You know the account. His old dad comes down and he gets to see his dad for the last 17 years of his life. He saw him the first 17 years of his life. Now he sees him the last 17 years of his life. Sweet dreams, Joseph. And then you come to the end of the chapter of the book of Genesis, the, the last chapter. You come over, uh, turn over there quickly to the 50th chapter uh, of the book of uh, Genesis. And uh, when Jacob dies and, and all the brothers are there so afraid that, that uh, Joseph is going to have vengeance against them and, and they come into him, you know, and they're begging him and all of that. And in verse 20, he says, uh, uh, as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. He knew Romans 8, 28 before it was even written. All, listen to this, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. You say, does that mean everything that happens to you is good? He didn't say that. He just said all things, which means all the good things, all the bad things, do what? Work together for good. God meant it un to good. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know the difficulties you may go, be going through. I don't know what shattered dreams there are in your life. But ladies and gentlemen, God takes every one of those circumstances and he uses them to put back the pieces of your shattered dreams so that one day it's going to be sweet dreams for you. And at the end of this chapter, you go on down to the end of this chapter. You know, it's an amazing chapter. Genesis starts with creation. It closes with a coffin. Genesis starts with God in creation, and it closes with a box of bones. Joseph said, I'm going to die, and God's going to deliver you from the land of Egypt. And he says in the verse 25, whatever you do, carry up my bones from hence. No, Joseph died, and they put his bones in a wooden box, and they put it over there in the Jewish museum. And mamas and daddies would bring their little boys and they'd say, see those bones right there? That's the bones of Joseph. 
And God has promised that one of these days, he's going to take us out of this land of bondage and we're going to take those bones of Joseph and we're going all the way through the wilderness and we're going in to the promised land. Those bones became a memorial body. Have you ever thought about it? That's exactly what we do at the Lord's Supper. We have a memorial body. The bread and the cup and it all points us to what he has done in the past and what he's going to do. Remember, remember I died for you on the cross. And you'll do this until he comes, the future. Did you know actually those bones preach a pretty good sermon about what salvation is all about? Those bones were taken out of Egypt. They were taken through the wilderness and they were taken into the promised land. That's the whole story of salvation. We're taken out, that's redemption. We're carried through, that's sanctification. And bless God, one of these days we're going up, that's glorification. Sweet dreams, one of these days. Oh, if you stay in the will of God, I may have to preach on the bones of Joseph last, next year. And old Joseph, can you imagine now, they take those bones of Joseph and they get to Shechem in the promised land and they Put those bones down in that burial pile. If you listen carefully, if you listen carefully, you can hear those bones of Joseph chuckling and say, saying, I told you so, I told you so. And one of these days, there's going to be an evacuation. One of these days, old Adam's bones are going to roll over uh, uh, to touch Noah's bones, and, and uh, Noah's bones are going to roll over, and they're going to touch Jacob's bones, and, and uh, Jacob's bones are going to roll over, and they're going to touch Joseph's bones, and Joseph's bones are going to roll over, and they're going to touch Paul's bones, and Paul's bones are going to roll over, and they're going to touch your bones, and my, my bone, the what, the toe bone connected to the foot bone, the foot bone connected to the uh, leg bone, the leg bone connected to the thigh. Now hear the word of the Lord. And we're going out of here to a brand new world. Woo! I'm hungry. <laughs> Let me tell you what, friend. The greatest thing you could ever do in your life today, if you've never been saved, is to walk down on one of these aisles, give your hand to the preacher or whoever receives you and say, I want this Jesus that the preacher has been talking about this morning. I want to be saved. I want to give my life to the Lord. If you're here and you need to be saved in a moment when we stand and when we sing, I'm going to ask you to just leave wherever you are, balcony, right, everything leads down here in front, all these aisles. Just come to whoever sees you and say, I want to be saved. And they'll help you. Somebody been saved here and you want to join the church. You need to. You need to be baptized like this person was today. Just come down and say, I've been saved. I want to be baptized. Some of you ought to join uh, Mims Baptist Church. I joined if I lived here. Just come say, join, I want to join the church. You know, I've visited people in Jacksonville and everywhere else, you know, and I'd talk to them about being saved, and if they're saved, I'd talk to them about church membership, and, and they'd be say, well, you know, we, we belong, uh, and, uh, and we're not sure, you know, we, we've moved down here from old Pine, Tucky up there in Georgia, and we're not going long, don't know how long we're going to be here. And I said, well, how long have you been here? 20 years. <laughs> you moved your furniture, didn't you, when you came to Conroe? Join a church. Get in a church. And then there may be some of you precious saints of God need to come and just get in this altar and just get on your face before God and whatever your experiences you're having, whatever your state of the dreams of your life are, just commit it all to God today and say, God, I know you're with me and you're going to carry me through. And one of these days I'll look back and I'll praise you for all you've done for my life. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Every head bowed. And every eye closed. Our Heavenly Father, we pray now that you will move in a special way in this service. Have your own way in the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. You've heard the invitation I have presented. If God has spoken to you on any of those points that I have brought up or something else, when we stand in a moment and the music begins, I want you to leave wherever you are and come and make that decision. Could we all stand together now? All of us standing.
And as this invitation is sung, step into the nearest aisle and, and come quickly. We won't, we won't tarry long. Come quickly right now.